going to extend the table out to those who are homebound or in the nursing home and places like that. So uh, when we take our feast together today, bear them in your hearts because we're going to go take it out to them. Uh, choir, no, let's see, Bible study is Tuesday night at 6 o'clock. Snacks are going to be provided. All men are welcome to attend. And the group's going to meet every other Tuesday. Then on Wednesday, there's choir practice at 7 p.m. And on Thursday is the session meeting at 6 p.m. So, again, another busy week. And Friday is Rosemary Women at 1 o'clock. Yes, I just went over to my house and added it to my calendar. Thank you for reminding me. Friday is Presbyterian Women at 1 o'clock. Didn't write it on here. And Super Bowl Sunday is next week, so please come bury cans or bags of soup mix or a financial donation to be given to the soup pantry and vote for your favorite team to win. I am from the divided household. <laughs> so, Eagles are the Chiefs, whatever. So. Other announcements anybody would like to share this morning? Remember, if you can give up your time to help people uh, with their GED exam, to talk to Ben sitting back there in the back pew. It's an online ministry that we can offer. Anyone else? I invite you to stand if you are able. And we will join in the call to worship.
salt over our shoulders, but find it hard to flavor a world made land by the ordinary. We dim our gifts to save our energy instead of shining as long as we can in society's shadow corners. We skip a meal once a week to show our faith, but are unable to see those who go through the dumpster to feed their children. Forgive us and have mercy, creation's goodness. By your grace, heal our brokenness, so we might fix the shattered dreams of our world. With our hope, strengthen our hearts, so we might fill the emptiness of our society. This we ask in the wonderful name of Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. God has heard our prayers and comes to us to sweeten our bitterness with hope, to shatter our darkness with the light of mercy. We will share this good news without being ordered to do so. We will praise God's name because we want to. Thanks be to God. Presbyterians don't talk about it really, really at all. Um, 
Susan is a Presbyterian minister. She loves Camera Moss. It's her favorite day. And you're supposed to give a gift to other believers of a candle to remind them that Jesus is the light of the world. Okay? That Simeon was so happy to see that the light of the world had come into the temple as a baby. And we remember that. And it just so happens that candle moss is about halfway through winter, which is kind of nice. Forty days after Christmas is just about halfway through winter. And um, so what else do we look at on February 2nd? Groundhog Harold comes out to see if there's enough light to see the shadow. I'm keeping Isn't it sharing your bread with the hungry 
and bringing the homeless poor into your house, covering the naked when you see them, and not hiding from your own family, then your light will break out like the dawn, and you will be healed quickly. Your own righteousness will walk before you, and the Lord's glory will be your rear guard. Then you will call, and the Lord will answer. You will cry for help, and God will say, I will hear. If you remove the yoke from among you, the finger pointing, the wicked speech, if you open your heart to the hungry and provide abundantly for those who are afflicted, your light will shine in the darkness, and your gloom will be like noon. The Lord will guide you continually and provide for you, even in parched places. He will rescue your bones. You will be like a water garden, like a spring of water that won't run dry. They will rebuild ancient ruins on your account. The foundations of generations past, you will restore. You will be called the mender of broken walls, restorer of livable streets. And from Matthew, we're continuing in chapter 5. This week it's verses 13 through 20. Hear the good news. You are salt of the earth. But if salt loses its saltiness, how will it become salty again? It's good for nothing except to be thrown away and trampled under people's feet. You are like the world. A city on top of a hill cannot be hidden. Neither do people light a lamp to put it under a bushel. Instead, they put it on top of a lampstand and it shines on all who are in the house. In the same way, let your light shine before people so they can see the good things you do and praise your Father who is in heaven. Don't even begin to think that I've come away, come to do away with the law and the prophets. I haven't come to do away with them, but to fulfill them. I say to you very seriously that as long as heaven and earth exist, neither the smallest letter nor even the smallest stroke of the pen will be erased from the law until everything there becomes a reality. Therefore, whoever ignores one of the least of these commands and teaches others to do the same will be called the lowest in the kingdom of heaven. But whoever keeps these commands and teaches people to do them will be called great in the kingdom of heaven. I say to you that unless your righteousness is greater than the righteousness of the legal experts in the Pharisees, you will never enter the kingdom. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Last week we remembered that Matthew was written at the latter part of the first century, most likely to Jewish Christians. Matthew wanted to draw the very solid connection between Jesus and the great leaders of Judaism in order to show that Jesus fulfilled the law of the Torah, the first five books of the Bible. And the prophecies that are found in what we call the Old Testament. And boy, oh boy, does he demonstrate that in the second half of our passage today. And that's where I'm going to start. Remember, we're going to spend the majority of the Sundays in this church here in Matthew. So getting these core principles down early will help us as the year progresses. Here again, verses 17 through 20. Don't even begin to think that I've come to do away with the law and the prophets. I haven't come to do away with them, but to fulfill them. I say to you very seriously that as long as heaven and earth exist, neither the smallest letter nor even the smallest stroke of a pen will be erased from the law until everything there becomes a reality. Therefore, whoever ignores one of the least of these commands and teaches others to do the same will be called the lowest in the kingdom of heaven. But whoever keeps these commands and teaches people to keep 
them will be called great in the kingdom of heaven. I say to you that unless your righteousness is greater than the righteousness of the legal experts and the Pharisees, you will never enter the kingdom of heaven. Matthew is teaching us that Jesus is doubling down on the ties between the promises of God, the actions of God, the command that God voices, our trust in God, the kingdom of heaven, Jesus' ministry, and the actions of all of his followers. It's a big deal. But he's saying to your to the disciples and subsequently to the crowd further down the mountain and to us, by the way, is y'all know and follow the basis. The Ten Commandments. No other gods. Do not make an idol. Do not use God's name improperly. Remember the Sabbath and keep it holy. Honor your father and your mother. Do not kill. Do not commit adultery. Do not steal. Do not testify falsely against your neighbor. And do not desire your neighbor's stuff. And the Shema. Israel, listen, our God is the Lord, only the Lord. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your being, with all your strength. These words that I'm commanding you today must always be on your mind. Recite them to your children. Talk about them when you're sitting around your house and when you are out about and when you are lying down and when you are getting up. Tie them on your hand as a sign. They should be on your forehead as a symbol. Write them on your house's door frames and on the city gates. Jesus in modern day terms is saying, while I understand that you might be hoping for the law 2.0, less laws, easier to follow, more easy going, that's not the case. So not the case. Jesus is letting the disciples, the crowd, and us know that all of the basics, plus the rest of the teachings of the prophets, are just the start. And it always has been just the start. Because if we trust God's promises, if we stand grateful for God's actions, then we are going to bend our lives toward the life-giving ways that God calls us to follow. Breaking that commandment is not just breaking the rule. It's denying the promises and the actions of God. Teaching others to do the same is not just leading them astray, but deforming their very being as children of a God who promises and who liberates and who teaches us how to live toward abundant life. So here's what I imagine. As, the, as Jesus is up on the mountain, he gets started teaching, and then what so often happens to me when I'm teaching or talking kind of off the cuff about stuff that really matters, I realize there's a key thing that I needed to say. And, and I have to say, I have to stop for a second and back up and explain the really important thing that y'all need to understand before I keep going. Because I forgot to tell you something really important. That's what I envision happening here. We started teaching and he's like, oh, whoa, 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 wait, I I gotta tell you that, that we're gonna build on the foundation that's already here. So, knowing that, let's return to the first part of our passage. Jesus is teaching his disciples about how they're gonna live their lives and their faith. He says, You are the salt of the earth. Now, for a long time, we've taken that statement to be, you should be agents of good, like salt makes things taste good. So we say that somebody is the salt of the earth, we basically mean that they're a good person. Not too flashy maybe, but he or she has a good heart. Well, Jesus actually had something a little spicier in mind. He was thinking of how salt enhances, brings out the taste of other flavors. It's zesty, it makes things zesty. Being disciples of Christ, is not supposed to be a bland and boring way of life. Much to the contrary, Jesus is saying we should spice things up. 
We should walk on the wild side, take risks, and refuse to always play it safe. Over the years and centuries, we Christians have gotten a reputation for being sticks in the mud. We don't like change. Heard that today. <laughs> we don't like change. As for the human species, we don't like change. But oh my goodness, God is all about change. God is all about us growing. God is all about us making mistakes, asking forgiveness, and trying again. We do that a lot in the church. I don't want it to change. But the early people who followed Jesus, just like Jesus himself, were radicals and rebels who lived out their faith with fire burning in their bellies. And he's trying to say to them, yep, we're starting a movement, but it's not anything else. We're building on a solid foundation. Don't forget that. Next, Jesus tells his listeners that they are the light of the world. And of course, just like us, they use the light to be able to see in the darkness, both outside and in. In fact, most family homes in the time of Jesus were so small that one oil lamp could provide the light for the entire house. Jesus was teaching his followers that if they were to live their that they were to live their faith in such a way that the people who saw them were inspired and gave glory to God. So which metaphor was right for those early Christian disciples who sat on the grass of the mountain listening to their Lord? Were they supposed to think them, of themselves as spice of salt or lights burning in the darkness or depending on who you were? Were they supposed to be people who lived their lives in faith with a fiery passion or with inspired dedication to God? The answer, of course, is both. You knew that. His disciples are the salt of the earth and the light of the world. Jesus is not mixing his metaphors here, he's connecting them together. The qualities his followers must have, the qualities Jesus is talking about, build upon one another. To use the mixed metaphors here, the salty, zesty spirit of a true believer must burn on throughout the night, giving light to all those around. And of course, the point for us is that Jesus wasn't simply talking to people sitting near him. Jesus' words have been passed down to us, and their truth rings in our ears, as clear and as strong as the church bells at the beginning of the service. We are the salt of the earth. We are the light of the world. With those promises come some awesome responsibilities. For instance, I hear so many people saying that the world has fallen apart. We've lost our values, our moral compass. My response to those complaints are always the same. It sounds to me like those of us who are supposed to care about the world and its people might be going a little easy on our responsibilities. If we can get ourselves worked up enough to be upset about the violence we see on TV or the abuse of drugs and alcohol throughout our society or about continued mentality that allows us to think that it's okay for the rich to get richer and the poor to stay poor, we got to do something about it. We can be salty agents of the world. We can work for a better community, a better state, a better country, a better world. We can work to bring the kingdom of heaven to earth. Seriously. We can join with others who share our concerns and who want to make a difference. We can lead by example, living our lives and our faith in ways which help to bring about the kind of world that we and God want it to be. Seriously, we need to work with God to bring the kingdom of heaven to earth. Working for social change is one of the hallmarks of being Presbyterian. Presbyterians have always been interested in things like quality education at all levels, from elementary to graduate schools. Even before we were called Presbyterians, that was a hallmark of who we were when education was a greater thing. Presbyterians make their voices heard and known in the great political debates.
gates of the day. Presbyterians have one rallying cry that can be heard above all others. Mission, mission, mission. We are called by Christ, the head of the church, to be salty. Like rock salt, we can melt the indifference and cynicism which has frozen so much of our society. And quite frankly, in my experience, a lot of church leadership, too. Especially at the pastoral level. Like a beacon in the night, we can be the way that our brothers and sisters around us can find safety and hope and renewal in faith. Jesus never once taught his disciples you are the couch potatoes of the world. Never did he say that it's okay for us to always and only just attend to our own business and leave the world to its own devices. Never does our Lord give us an excuse for not caring. Granted, there are times when we may be the one who needs who need to receive the care. There may be times where we need to attend to our business. And when we can, as soon as we're built back up, as soon as that wick gets a little more life, a little more strength in it, then we go out and do. There are rough times for all of us. Instead, he says, we've come to fulfill the law, he says to them, down to its last letter. And we've heard the heart of the law reading in the words of the prophet Isaiah, is this not the fast I choose to lose the bonds of injustice, to undo the thongs of the yoke, to let the oppressed go free, and to break every yoke? Is it not to share your bread with the hungry, and to bring the homeless poor into your house, and when you see the naked, to cover them, and not hide yourself? My friends, as a whole, we spend too much time talking the talk and not nearly enough time walking the walk. And what do you know that the kids sang today that I hadn't heard them sing before? Song about talking the walk. Walking the talk. Walking the talk. If we are bold enough to call ourselves a disciple of Christ, then we must be bold enough and bright enough and nervy enough to live like he commands us to. The writer of the book of James, I think, has it right. Faith without works is dead. Faith without works is salt without its saltiness. It's a light hidden under the basket destined soon to go out. We have a world, a nation, a community, and a church that have all been in our care. Seriously, are we going to partner with God and one another to bring the kingdom of heaven to earth, or are we going to sit around and bemoan in its brokenness? I call us to listen to Jesus and Isaiah. I call for us to respond to them. I call for us to live our lives and our faith in ways that matter and in ways that bring glory to our God. Amen. If you are able, I invite you to stand and join in singing hymn number 77. Today, we all are called to be disciples.
Sir, what would you like to share today? Yes? We had a joy at the end of January. Our son, Pete, was married to Taylor Platt. Oh, nice. Congratulations. Crystal, but Crystal, I'm sure, is having an entertaining time. Um, you probably, most people with the prayer chain already knew that Daryl had suffered a, a stroke. A mild stroke. A mild stroke. But he's already back at home. Yes. And seems to be doing very well. So thankfully, uh, Crystal's brother was there, and he was able to be like, nope, really, you need to go to the ER. He was able to assess him, and they did the clot blocker thing, and everything seems to have worked the way you would have hoped it would work. That's awesome. Does anybody need me to repeat that? I'm going to be out. Okay. Anyone else? Yeah. Yes. Okay. 
So uh, prayers for Stephanie Z. Chris, who um, has a giant circle on her hand, and they are going to uh, do radiation for the next five weeks in hopes of shrinking the tumor and allowing them to do surgery and not have to um, go through lots of therapy or, you know, maybe lose function or other things in her hand. So. Yes? Uh, Ray and I are going to be traveling this week to go to Geneva. Our second oldest granddaughter, uh, we're going to the parents' night for her gymnastics tomorrow night. So she's a one year of gymnastics. She's been doing this for 14 years. So wow. she's got a couple more meets, and uh, so it'll be a big honor for us to go see her tomorrow night. Okay, so they're, she and Randy are traveling to Lake Geneva. Lake Geneva. I knew the Geneva part, I wasn't sure about the lake. So Lake Geneva to be at their second oldest granddaughter's senior, Her senior parent night for gymnastics. She's been doing gymnastics for 14 years and we're thrilled that they're going to be able to be there on that special honor. Michelle, I'm glad to see you doing this because I was feeling into you. She's a little hard today. Isn't that nice in the middle of winter? Yeah. Well, you know. <laughs> It, it'll be nicer in about five more minutes. <laughs> <laughs> okay. All right. Any more? Okay. Let us pray. God of grace and glory, we thank you for bringing your light into our world and calling us to also be your light in the world. We thank you for the ways that we are able to shake a little bit of zestiness into life, the ways that we're able to pray and care for one another, the ways that we're able to have challenging conversations with one another and sometimes even relative strangers knowing that something's got to change. You call us to bring, to work with you to bring the kingdom of heaven to earth. Help us to continue to celebrate those times when we see that actually happening. And help us to use those moments as inspiration to continue to work for your realm your ways, your love, to pervade, to prevail, to spread. Gracious God, I thank you for this community of faith that prays earnestly for one another. And I pray that all of those that we have lifted up this morning and those who are on our written prayer list and those who's whose challenges reside in our hearts and in our daily prayers, will feel your love, your presence with them in good times and in bad. Gracious God, we thank you for your Son, Jesus Christ, who not only taught us, who not only prays for us, who not only reigns in power for us, but also gave us the gift Supper. Be with us as we come to the table together and help bind us to all those who are unable to be here this morning as they take part in the feast in their own homes or as we go out to take it to them. We pray, O oh God, that this time, this worship, this feast, will nourish us for whatever comes in this given week. In Jesus' name, we lift the prayer that he taught, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. For thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation. Deliver us from evil, for thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen.
you do not need to be a member of this congregation in order to participate in this feast. All are welcome. Hear the words of institution of the Holy Supper of our Lord Jesus Christ. The Lord Jesus, on the night of his arrest, took bread, and after giving thanks to God, he broke it, and he gave it to them, saying, Take, eat, this is my body, given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And in the same way, after supper, he took a cup, saying, This cup is the new covenant, sealed in my blood, shed for the forgiveness of sins. Drink of it in remembrance of me. Every time you eat this bread and drink from this cup, you proclaim the Lord's saving death until he comes. Let us offer God our grateful praise in prayer. May the Lord of the feast be with you. And and also with you. You are God's salt here on earth. We offer our hearts to God so they may be spiced with mercy, justice, and love. You are God's light in this time. We show the world our brokenness in its sins, so that all creation might be healed. You would not let emptiness remain constant, God of wisdom and wonder, but brought forth creation. Flavoring the seas with your salty tears, lightening the shadow of chaos, so the universe could find the way as it unfolded from your imagination. You shaped us in your image, hoping that in faith we would fast on you, fast with you on justice, peace, reconciliation, and joy. But when sin laid out its feast, we ran, pushing and shoving to the table to gorge ourselves on tempting entrees, to be stuffed by deadening desserts. Prophets came, reminding us of our stubbornness, but we only practiced righteousness, never getting past the first act. So you sent Jesus to us to show us the fast you choose. So we join our voices with those who call out to you in every age, singing of your hopes for us. Holy, holy, holy are you, God, who holds our hearts. All creation proclaims that the mystery decreed before the ages. Hosanna in the highest. Blessed is the coming one who is taught by the Spirit. Hosanna in the highest. You are the holiness of our lives, loving God, and Jesus Christ is your light for all. The bright morning star of creation, he will not remain hidden but came to light the way for us. The one who hung the stars in the heavens, he comes to loosen the knots, tied tightly around the hearts of the oppressed. The one who received every gift from you empties the closets filled with grace and hope, sharing them with sisters and brothers everywhere. The one who holds us in his heart opens his hands in surrender on the cross, so that death's clenched fist will release us, so our healing will spring up to embrace us. As we remember how his light shone on all, as we celebrate the spirit which enhances our lives, we must speak of that mystery of faith. Christ died to fulfill the law and the prophets. Christ rose to give glory to God. Christ will come to illuminate to the kingdom. Pour out your spirit upon the gifts of bread and the cup prepared for those who love you. As we unclench our fists to receive your brokenness, we would open our hearts in love to those burdened by hopelessness. We would feed all who hunger. As we are welcomed at your table and nourished by the cup of life, we would add a room onto our homes to shelter our family, we would share from our abundance to rebuild the shattered lives of the poor. And 
with the yoke of time has been removed, and we gather at the feast prepared for us in glory, our songs of thanksgiving will be like springs of water which will flow for all eternity into your heart, God and community, holy in one. Amen. Will the servers please come forward for all is ready.
like a spring whose waters never fail. God calls us to share what we have received. Let us offer ourselves and our gifts to God.
time. You guys send a text out or something? Or I'll give it to you right now. No, this is fine. I don't know. Is that for know. sure? Send a text out. I'll send a text yeah. out. Okay, sounds good.